Good morning, beloved. Welcome to Westside. We are glad you are here. I pray that you are preparing your hearts even now to come into the Lord's presence in worship. Before we do, just a quick reminder about the giving. As you know, we're back uh, just online now, so uh, I would pray that God would use you to support his work, that he's blessing you and caring for you as he always does because he is our sole provider. And as he does that, we need to faithfully trust him and to support the work that he wants to do to expand his kingdom through his church, through his people. And so uh, we would really um, ask that you be prayerful about this and really consider uh, being as faithful as you possibly can and even going above and beyond that to meet the needs of our ministry at this time because it is a, a difficult time for everyone, including this ministry, and we're trusting God to work in your life to support the work that he's doing here. Without any further delay, let's go to the Lord in worship.
worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name Surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I child of God and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God from my mother's womb you have chosen me and love has called I've been born again into your family, and your blood flows through my veins. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear, and I am a child of God, and I'm no longer. What a great time in worship. And now let's come to the Lord's word. Father, we pray that you would speak this morning as always. We want and need truth. And you alone have it, Lord. You embody it. And so we pray that you would speak your truth into our hearts and bring transformation as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be concluding our Skyward series Discovering Joy and Confidence. And in it, I've been trying to show you through God's Word how even in times like this, and especially in times like this, we need to avoid the temptation of just looking around and drawing conclusions about our reality based on what we see, what we feel, what others are doing, and instead look up and to remember our God and to allow him to speak into our heart. 
the real truth of what he expects from us and also to experience his eyes and to see things for the way they really are. And we've also seen that he provides for us everything that we need to be able to not just survive in trial, but to really flourish. We've seen in week one that he provides wisdom as he did with his servant Solomon. And wow, wisdom is such an important thing for us because there is a lot of misinformation and there are a lot of lies out there and we don't want to be caught up in those. We also saw he provides justice. We saw that through the life of Jezebel, of all people, that God is always watching and he's warning and he's working. We saw that he's a God of mercy through the life of the paralytic whose friends lowered him down through the ceiling and Jesus healed him. We saw that he's a God of blessing through the life of Jacob, but he doesn't always bless the way we think. And then lastly, we saw that he's a God of encouragement through the life of David. At some of David's lowest points, he turned to his God and was strengthened and comforted and encouraged, and we can do the same. And this week, we're going to take a look at the final aspect of God's promise for us in difficult times like this. And this is the one that actually pertains to the future. It is our hope, and that is renewal, complete renewal. And so for this, you need to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And as you do, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, we see that the book was written by the apostle John while he was on an island called Patmos. Patmos ex uh, still exists today. It's, it's a small, little desolate, rocky enclave in the Aegean Sea, some 50 miles southwest of Ephesus off the coast of modern Turkey. And when I mean small, I mean small. It's only four by eight miles, the whole thing. And the question is, Patmos was a long way from home for John, someone born and raised in Israel, in the area of Galilee, who probably hadn't ever left very far from home, probably the most he'd ever been away from home was either to visit Jerusalem in the south or the places that he went with Jesus in traveling. And now we see him far from home on an isolated island in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the sea. And then the question is, how did he get there and why? Well, Following the resurrection of Christ and the establishment of the first century church and then the execution of his older brother James by Herod Agrippa, John became one of the most prominent apostolic leaders of the church. He and Peter were, were like the two pillars. But with the later arrival of Paul the apostle, the primary focus of New Testament history shifts away from the original 12, and on to Paul. And as a result of that, there are a lot of gaps, historically speaking, as to what became of both John and the other disciples in the aftermath of the New Testament. We do know that at the time that Paul makes his final visit to the Jerusalem church leaders in Acts chapter 21, that John is not mentioned as being among them and he very likely would have been because he was one of the most prominent apostles, which I think is a relatively strong proof that he had relocated by then, that he was no longer living in Jerusalem, and this would have been prompted, um, in part at least, by the persecution that was coming against the church, and he would have been a primary target. I think the idea of relocation is further indicated by the letters that John would write Afterward, he writes three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then he also writes the Revelation in which he describes uh, verbatim this vision that Jesus gives him while he's on Patmos. And all of these subsequent writings that John uh, makes uh, are related in some way to the churches of Asia Minor. And so the consensus among modern scholars and and I would agree, is that at some point, John had left Jerusalem, perhaps 
dispatched by the church in order to go and oversee where some of the best work outside of Jerusalem in the Christian church was going on, which is in the area of Asia Minor. Most of the churches that were in Asia Minor, which is in modern Turkey, would be very familiar to. And it's believed that his headquarters was probably in the primary church of this area, which was in Ephesus. But it still leaves us the question, <clears throat> excuse me, if he was in Ephesus and that was his base of operations to oversee all of these churches in Asia Minor, how did he wind up going from there to this little remote island in the middle of nowhere? Well, at the time, we do know historically that Patmos was a prison. It was a Roman penal colony. It, it was very similar to France's Devil's Island, which indicates that at some point, Paul had been arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to a punitive exile there on Patmos, probably almost without doubt related to his what, what Rome would have viewed as countercultural um, commitment as an apostle to the Christian faith. And that's what the early church fathers and historians wrote. A guy by the name of Eusebius wrote that uh, John was indeed imprisoned at Patmos for years and was only released shortly before his death, uh, somewhere around the end of the first century, around 96 to 98 AD, after having uh, outlived all of the other original disciples and many others from the first century. And yet, while he's on this island, marooned away from society, surrounded, if by anybody, other prisoners, it's during this dark and difficult time that John receives one of the most spectacular visions and revelations of the future that anybody ever received. It speaks of an inexorable future, an unstoppable future, where godless humanity is brought to account and judged, finally. The redeemed are rescued. History ends. Heaven and earth are remade. And eternity begins. And as John records and then later transmits his apocalyptic vision via letters, to the seven churches of Asia Minor that were under his care, it was his hope that it would serve as both purification and encouragement for those who read it. And I believe the same holds true today. And so with that, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21 and read some of what he wrote. Verse 1, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. John records this, in some cases bizarre, but very accurate vision of future events, something that he probably had no idea would be so far in the future, which is why many of the images that he saw, I'm sure, were difficult for him to define. But he talks about literally Earth's history coming to a conclusion and what's going to happen. He talks about uh, the politics of the day. And he predicts, well, he doesn't, but the vision that he receives from Jesus accurately predicts many of the things that are shaping up in our own world even now. But at the end of all of that, when Christ returns and ultimately fulfills his promise, to bring all things to account before God. He judges the godless. He rescues the redeemed. And then this world is done away with in favor of a new one. It says that there's a new heaven and a new earth where the first heaven and the first earth where we're living right now had passed away and there was no longer any sea. A new heaven and a new earth. What does that mean? Well, throughout the Bible... We're told that because the world and the universe that we're in now is cursed by sin, that there's just no redeeming it. It's, it's poisoned. It's toxic. And if you doubt me, watch the news. This place is just devastated by sin, and God has promised time and again that he's going to start over again. 
One of the analogies in Scripture is, is sort of like what happened during the time of Noah, where God started over. Well, in this case, he's going to remake everything. We see that in Psalm 102, Isaiah 65, Luke 21, 2 Peter 3, over and over and over again, we're told there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. The question is, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? And we're told that God's going to renew everything, and that's our hope, is the renewal. What's it going to be like? It says it's going to be new. Does that mean it's going to be strange and bizarre and completely unfamiliar to us? Are we going to just be disoriented and trying to make sense of this new reality that's around us? Sort of like being catapulted into the world of Dr. Seuss or something? No. Not completely. The word new in Greek is kainos, and it, in, it emphasizes a newness of quality as opposed to format. In other words, the new heaven and earth won't necessarily be entirely distinct from the original heaven and earth, at least not in construct, but rather in moral character. The primary difference between the new heaven and earth to come and this place is the fact that the new place won't be polluted by the curse. Romans 8, verses 18 to 22, seems to indicate that there is actually continuity between the world we're living in now and the one that is to come. We're told that the one now is groaning under the curse and is awaiting liberation. And we're told that the new world will be purged of any and all vestiges of sin, and that it will be recast with wonders that are beyond our imagination. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, where Paul says, no mind has conceived. And yet it's also going to retain some of the things that are familiar to us. There's, well, for example, there will be people there. There will be vegetation, music, food, travel, worship, discovery, interaction, creativity, growth. Not to mention joy, love, laughter, provision, life. And those are just a few of the things that we're told this new heaven and earth will have. So there's, even though there are really kind of scant details given to us about what the new heaven and earth will be like, and that's probably to keep us from arrogance. Like Paul said, he saw a vision of this place, but was told he couldn't speak about it. And that he also was given at the same time a thorn in the flesh that kept him from getting arrogant. And I think also it prevents us from being distracted too so that that's all we're thinking about and are not focused on what God has called us to do here which is to try to preach the gospel. But even though we have scant details, I think we can rest assured of this. Whatever this new heaven and new earth are going to be like, it will be familiar enough to feel like home and yet pure and unique enough to keep us amazed and joyfully occupied for an eternity. It will not be boring. Bible scholar W.E. Vine once said that the main difference between this world and the one to come is that people here walk on God and worship gold, and people there will walk on gold and worship God. I like that. It also says that there will no longer be any sea. Now, it's possible that the sea, or ocean being spoken of here, isn't necessarily the system of oceans that we know today and that God created, but rather is a reference to sort of the metaphorical sea that we see spawns the Antichrist. In, in ancient thought, the sea was sort of a representation of the sea of of lost and wicked humanity that sort of governs this world and this place. So it could be it's just talking about there won't be any more of that. But if it is talking about the actual sea, there could be some sense to that because if you think about it today, the oceans cover about 75% of the Earth's surface. And assuming that the new heaven and new Earth have roughly the same dimensions, then that would mean a lot more space for human occupation and other activities. Moreover, oceans have historically presented barriers between people. It's what separates the continents and separates the nations. And in this new world, there won't be any such separation. 
But it doesn't mean there won't be any large bodies of water because Revelation 22, the very next chapter, describes a great life-giving river that flows right down the middle of the main city, the new Jerusalem. And speaking of that, verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, which means the old Jerusalem, along with the old world and the old heavens, both the atmospheric heavens and the earth, will be dealt with and done away with. And this new Jerusalem that's coming is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised his disciples in John 13 and 14, where he told them, I'm going to have to leave you. It was right toward the end of his life. And he says, the Son of Man is, is going to be betrayed and crucified. And he'll die and he'll raise again. But basically, he's going to be leaving you. And of course, his disciples were heartbroken. They loved him. They didn't want him to go anywhere. And Jesus told them, I have to leave. Why? Because I have to go and prepare a place for you. Well, guess what? This is the place. This is the place that Jesus went to prepare for them. And it says that it has been prepared as a bride. It says this city that's going to come down from God out of heaven to this new heaven and this new earth is going to be like a prepared bride. What does that mean? Well, I don't have a ton of experience with with how brides prepare for their wedding. Uh, I have married a lot of people. I've observed a lot of brides, and and for me, the most beautiful I ever saw was my then-girlfriend, who was about to become my wife. When she walked down the aisle, it was the most staggering thing I had ever seen. And we're told that this city is going to have sort of the same effect. There's a tradition now that the groom doesn't see the bride, and the idea is, is so that when the bride first appears, that the groom is sort of taken back with, her beauty, her virtue. I mean, women, when they get married, that's the one thing. They spend a lot of time preparing themselves so that they will look on that day the best they've ever looked. And that's what this city is going to resemble. It said it's going to be meticulously adorned in white, absolutely pure, and incomparably beautiful. What a stark contrast between this city which is called the city of God, and another city that's described a few chapters earlier in Revelation 17 and 18 as the center for all global human activity. It's a wicked city that cares only about money and where the leaders are ruthless and the whole world is consumed with going their own way and giving no thought or regard for God. It's referred to metaphorically as Babylon, And it is described as a whore. What a stark difference between the kingdoms and the cities and the concerns of the world today and this beautiful city that will one day come and become the capital of the whole world for the redeemed. It's also interesting to note that the metaphor of a bride is used both in the Old Testament to describe the saints of the Old Testament, and in the New Testament to describe the church. And we'll see later that this city has, has gates and names that are written on it and stones that are in it that sort of merge Old Testament believers with New Testament believers, which means I believe they'll both reside there. And the question then becomes, well, if you take all of the Old Testament saints that lived before and all of the members of the New Testament church and you put them into all one location in one city, is there going to be enough room? This could be a pretty tight place if there's a lot of people. Well, perhaps not, because we see later on in this same chapter, as John describes the dimensions of this city that are measured off by an angel, we see that it has a, basically the square footage of it is about 1.9 million miles. That is a bigger footprint than India. And that's just the base of it. We're told that it is cubic in shape, And if you assume that since it is cubic and massive in shape, that it has multiple floors, which would make sense. Otherwise, you've just got this enormous ceiling and a lot of wasted space. So if you had floors, and let's say the floors were 12 feet apart from one another, you would have room 
in a city this size for 600,000 stories. 600,000 stories in this city that extends well beyond our current atmosphere and into space. How is that possible? I don't know. It's a new heaven and a new earth. I would suspect there are new rules. And I think there's going to be a whole lot more that's different. But one thing's for sure, there'll be plenty of room for everybody. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now this loud voice that speaks is more than likely an angel because throughout this revelation that John receives, there are angels making declarative statements. And we know that angels are the heralds or messengers of God. And here, the angel affirms and declares that a new reality has come to human existence. What does it involve? Well, first of all, God's dwelling place is now among his people. The word dwelling place, translated uh, that way in the NIV, is a Greek word, skene. It means literally tent or tabernacle. That sort of conjures ideas about when, in the Old Testament, when God first introduces his presence to his people during the time of Moses, and he instructs him to build a tabernacle that was uh, sort of a copy of the one that's in heaven, and we're told that God's presence would rest inside the most holy place of the tabernacle, and it represented God's presence on earth with his people. The separation between the world we live in and whatever dimension God exists in was for the first time closed off, and God came into proximity of his people, and they called it the tabernacle. Matter of fact, they would often say, God is tabernacling with his people. Well, here the word skene in Greece means tent or tabernacle. It's also the root word for our English term scene or scenery. The reason for that is because when uh, the Greeks would do dramatic presentations, they would build backdrops, backdrops for telling a dramatic story, and they referred to them as skene. And here we see that John employs that same word in describing the new relationship, the new reality of this new place that's coming. He also uses the same word in his gospel, John 1, verse 14. It says, the word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, and he made his dwelling, skene, among us. When Jesus came to earth and took on his flesh, became a human, he was pitching a fleshly tent among us to be with us. And we've seen his glory, John 1, 14, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Throughout Scripture, perhaps the most inexplicable concept of all, the primary concept and the one that we have a hard time wrapping our minds around is that God Almighty wants anything to do with us. And yet he does. Matter of fact, we're told over and over again that he desires and pursues a relationship with humanity. He created Adam and Eve to be in relationship with him. He created, a, he created them. He created a place for them. And he interacted with them. We're told that he would walk with them in the cool of the garden, which means he must have had some sort of human form to do that. I believe another theophany. And when he would be with them. They had intimacy. They had relationship because God wanted that. And does it make sense from a theological perspective? Not a lot. If you were God, why would you care about humanity? And if you think that's me being harsh, I'm just agreeing with the angels because they scratch their head and can't figure it out either, according to 1 Peter 1, 12. But we're told repeatedly, the Lord longs for an interpersonal connection with his people. It starts in the Old Testament, Leviticus 26, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 2, verse 11. We're also told that the only response you and I seem to have to that is pushback and rejection. He wants a relationship with us, and our nature is to not reciprocate. We don't want a relationship with him. And yet, despite that constant rejection, 
God continues his pursuit. And that culminates in Jesus leaving heaven's glory and arriving on the scene to pitch his fleshly tent among us. What an amazing truth that he should do that. And now we see here that one day he's going to do so permanently. You see, the thing that broke the disciples' heart was the times when Jesus would say, I'm going to have to leave you. This is going to have to end. Now, there's a good reason for it. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I won't leave you as orphans. I'm sending my spirit to indwell you and empower you and to remind you that it won't always be like this, that there's a day coming when I'm going to come back and we're going to be reunited and it's going to be forever. Forever. You know, people are always trying to earn their way up into heaven, find their way up into heaven. That's all human religion is about, earning your way up into heaven. And it is a futile endeavor. We're told right here that for the saved, for those who place saving faith in Christ and believe in what he did and what he said, that one day God's going to do just the opposite. He's going to bring heaven down to us. As pastor and author Randy Alcorn once said, the ultimate goal isn't us with God. It's God with us. It says, God himself will be with them. Now just stop and consider this staggering statement. God himself will be with them, John speaks of those who are the redeemed, those who are in this new heaven and earth. We're going to have unending, uninterrupted, unfettered, intimate access with the creator of all that is. I'm not just talking about mind-blowing exposure to the mystery and possibilities of existence, which we'll be able to pursue, but I'm also talking about absolute safety and security from any potential harm. Think about that. Not just the ability to, you know, get all your questions answered and to discover this new world and marvel at all that God has created, but to do so in an atmosphere where you don't ever have to be afraid of anything ever again. Does that sound good to you now? How would you like to live in a world where you never had to be afraid? You know, if I think if I had to try to quantify the number one thing that most Americans and most people in the world have right now going on in their heart, it is fear. It's fear. And why? Because there's a lot to be afraid of. This is a dark and dangerous world, and bad things happen even to good people. How would you like to be in a place where that was no longer the reality? Verse 4, it gets better. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He will wipe away every tear. You know, I've always thought when I read that, I've always thought, boy, is heaven going to be a real weepy place? I mean, I don't know if the, the Kleenex company is going to be in heaven, but it sounds like they might kind of, you know, make a killing here. If, if there's going to be this much crying, and you always sort of had this image of Jesus just, you know, running from person to person to person to person, having to wipe tears, because everybody there, they're like, <laughs> and, and, and that's, the, that's the reality of heaven. You know what? That is not what this passage is saying. As a matter of fact, in the very next statement, after it says he'll wipe every tear away, it says that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. So there's not going to be any more crying in heaven any more than there's going to be death. Or mourning. So what does it mean? You know, I mean, and if you really want to think about it, Isaiah 65, 17 is a really interesting verse. It says, this is God speaking. It says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. 
which means all of the stuff of this current heaven and earth that is heartbreaking and tear-inducing is going to be not just eliminated, but forgotten. Now, I don't think we're going to have all of our memories erased, but I do think everything that causes pain, everything sin-related from this lost and dying world is going to be swept away. Tears are going to be wiped out. They're going to become an unnecessary relic of the past. And they're going to be displaced by the joy and the serenity of Christ's presence. There's not going to be any reason to cry, beloved. Because all of the stuff that hurt us, all of the stuff that made us sad, every thought, every concept, anything that might possibly grieve us or make us cry is going to be wiped away when we enter this new reality. And it's not just going to be without tears. It's also going to be without death or mourning or pain. Each one of those things, all negative, are directly related to the curse and are going to have been removed by Christ in this new place. They can never touch us again. And I, for one, look forward to the day when I'll never have to comfort anybody again because they're brokenhearted. Where I won't ever have to say goodbye to somebody in death that I love. And frankly, as a pastor, where I'll never have to do another funeral service. This sounds like my kind of place here. This sounds like the place I would wish I were in right now, frankly. It says the old order of things has passed away here. You know, I have to ration myself on the news. I've told you that before because it is just overwhelming. There is just so much bad news. And as you watch the news and observe the current traje trajectory of human events, aren't you ready for a place where the things that are going on now are going to be brought to an end and where every reality has been transformed by God? Wouldn't it be great to turn on the news and have it all be good? Wouldn't it be great to not have to get up in the morning and to push out of your mind all of the things that are crushing you and choking you and scaring you and breaking your heart and making you angry and causing you to be frustrated and causing you to despair and to struggle with depression and to maybe even feel like ending it? Wouldn't it be great to be in a place where none of that ever happened? That's what we have waiting for us. And finally it says in verse 5, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now finally, God himself speaks from his throne. And not, you know, unexpectedly, he's making a promise. Remember I told you that this vision that John received that he passed on to the churches yes there was a lot of dark and scary stuff in it you're talking about everything ugly and dark and sin related being brought to a violent end and yet at the back side of that all of that ugliness is swept away and now God makes a promise to his people who by the way many of these Asia minor churches were suffering horribly they were being persecuted. They were struggling to meet because of outside pressure. And then others were being compromised by that pressure and, and were giving in and going over to the world and people were betraying people. It was a difficult time. Read the first part of Revelation as it addresses the seven churches. And God is speaking to his people directly and he tells them, I'm going to make you a promise. And what is the promise? I'm making everything new. What does this mean? When God says, I'm going to make everything new, what does that entail? Well, part of it will be the removal of a negative, as I've told you. 
Sin's ugly yet all too familiar ramifications. Things like illness, disability, injury, depression, anger, pride, violence, racism, sexual crime, suicide, and even death, and countless others will be eliminated. But I believe it, it refers to more than that. I think it's talking about a way of life that is beyond our current frame of reference. Remember I told you it's going to be a mix of some familiar and some magical, mystical, wondrous, new reality? Think about Adam and Eve when they first awoke in the Garden of Eden. A brand new world. Some of it, I'm sure, seemed very familiar to them. But there were a lot of mystical, wondrous things there. I'm sure they were thunderstruck as they explored this amazing new place under the watchful guidance of their creator. And in the same way, this new heaven and earth, I believe, this new universe that's awaiting us is going to contain an eternity's worth of jaw-dropping marvels. I'm making everything new. Think about the same God who created heaven and earth. We live in a cursed world now, and there are still some spectacular things here that have survived as a remnant of God's creative beauty. But imagine if he got rid of everything that we ourselves have destroyed by sin and that the creation itself is waiting. When is it going to end? When is it going to be renewed? Imagine when God finally brings it to reality. Not surprising that the Lord says, so John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He tells John, listen, you make sure you write this down because this is my guarantee to you and to my people. Now think about John. He has been marooned on an island. He's probably having to scavenge for food. He gets no visitors. If there's anybody else there, they're criminals. They're probably isolated from one another. He's lost his brother. Probably many of the other disciples by now have been martyred, or he hasn't heard from them in a while. He can't be around the church that he has been dispatched to watch over. About the best he can do is maybe if, if letters get brought across to him via boat, which would have been a slow and dangerous process. He's there by himself and he's struggling and he's wondering, God, do you still have anything for me? And God speaks to John and says, oh, yes. And he cracks open his mind and his spirit and he pours into him something that I'm sure for John was overwhelming. When Daniel received a similar revelation, it almost overwhelmed him. And now John receives the fullness of what God is going to do in the future. It encourages John. It encourages his readers. Beloved, it encourages us. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that God is making a promise to us about a new world that's coming. This is not our home. Which brings me to my three points. First of all, God's renewal is going to involve three things. The first is a new residence. A new residence. Verse 2 says, John speaking says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. We have a new home coming. How does that grab you? A new home. You know, th there's something about the idea of a new home. Especially if you're living in a time or in a place where it just seems all bad. You know, I know there are some of you out there right now that are looking at other places other than where we live right now, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I wish we could move there, or I'm going to move there someday, and why? Because it represents to you a fresh start and a way to escape all of the negative stuff that's going on around you. The only problem with that is, is no, no matter where you go, you're still living in a cursed world, and you're still taking your own sin nature with you. And you can't really ever escape from the things that really vex us. That's just sort of 
the grass is always greener on the other side. But more importantly, the idea of a new home here is a very, very different thing. This place is not our home, as I told you before. Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not our home. That's how you can find peace even in the circumstances we're in now because you can remember this isn't really my home. This, you know, my whole life isn't banked on what happens here. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And therefore, it really doesn't matter where we are here. Because we are God's ambassadors wherever he places us. And he will watch over us wherever he has us. There's sweet relief in knowing that, that we're not laying up for ourselves treasures here on earth where thieves break in and steal, where moth destroys where rust corrodes. But our treasure is in heaven because that's our home. God is going to create a new home for us right underneath our feet. We're not going to have to travel someplace to get to it. He's going to put it right underneath our feet. He's going to sweep all of this mess out of the way and bring us a new home. Beloved, you need to rejoice in that and hang on to it. Write it down, for these words are faithful and true. It is God's promise. We have a new home waiting for us. We also have a new relationship. It says that verse 3, God's dwelling place is now among the people. A new relationship where God is skene with us on the scene He's going to make his home permanently with us. What an amazing thing. What would it be like to have direct access to Christ? Have, ever read some of the stories in the gospel and thought, I wish I could have seen that. I wish I could have been there. Or I wish I could talk to him and ask him a question. I, I would have had a question. I have questions now. Psalm 23, 6. David said, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to have a new home, and we're going to have a new relationship in that home with our God. Access. How amazing will that be? access to God where he can show us all of the mysteries of, of, of some of the things that we didn't understand here and more importantly can reveal to us things that our minds can't even conceptualize. It breaks my heart when I hear people say, well, you know, heaven sounds pretty boring, laying on a cloud, playing a harp, that's, that's really going to be the end of it. I don't have time to explain to you why that's not really a biblical concept. Let me just tell you that what is waiting for us defies description. It defies description. And it's going to make everything that we're going through now seem like, what was I worried about? Why was I upset? Why did it feel like my world was ending when this happened or that happened? As I look around now at the new reality... God is going to renew everything, beloved. He's going to renew everything. A new residence, a new relationship, and lastly, a new reality. A new reality. It says, verse 4, the old order of things has passed away. You know what the old order of things represents? All the junk that we struggle with now. That's the old order of things. Isn't it interesting that it refers to it in Revelation in the past Tense, even though you and I are experience all this, experiencing all this junk in real time, we're told that it is the old order of things. And it's dying. As a matter of fact, it's already dead. Listen to this, 2 Peter 3.13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. 
How would you like to live in a place where you didn't need to be afraid about anything? Where you were never going to be sad again? No death, no mourning, no sickness, no fear, no crime, no, no being hurt by anything or anyone, nothing evil, nothing dangerous, nothing sad can ever come to you again. You know, some of you, I know, you've, you've had some bad experiences. Some of you have gone through some difficult stuff. Some of you are in the middle of some difficult stuff. Doesn't this sound refreshing, that this is our hope? Doesn't it give you strength and encouragement, as I'm sure it did these Asia Minor churches and the church in general, when they read these things, to say, you know what, I'm okay. No matter what I'm going through now, yeah, it might be difficult, but I'm okay because I have just been reminded of the promise of God about what is coming. I have been reminded that this is not my home. I have been reminded that my relationship with God is one day going to be interpersonal, one-to-one. -one. It's going to be, finally, what he has always wanted it to be. And because I have his spirit in me, I want that too. Beloved, I love prayer. I pray every day. Not to brag, just a fact, I pray for hours every day. Why? Because it's the closest I can get to God in this world that I live in now. But you know something? There's going to be a day when my prayer and yours is going to be transformed into conversation and communion. He will be present with us. You know, every time we take communion, it says we celebrate the Lord's uh, re resurrection and return until he comes again. There's one day that he's going to take communion with us. He's going to break the bread himself and hand it to us. He's going to pass the cup himself and hand it to us. That's what's waiting for us. A new residence, a new relationship, and a new reality. I, I can't wait. I hope you can't either. Dear ones, don't trade in this promise for the stuff of this world. Paul called it a gigantic dung heap. I think that's being polite. Don't allow temporary discouragements of what's going on in our world now to crush out your hope and make you despair. Don't allow it to cause you to start looking for greener grass somewhere else or to just lose hope. Beloved, remember the promise of God, a new heaven and a new earth. It is as guaranteed as anything else in life. And it puts a whole new perspective to our existence now. Everything that happens now happens for a purpose. Nothing comes to us without first passing through the hands of our God who has called us into a new home and a new relationship and a new reality to come and has given us the down payment of his spirit to see us through so that we can be transformed in the way we see this old world, this old reality that's already dead. The only thing that's going to survive this place, beloved, are people and God's kingdom. That puts a whole different spin on everything, doesn't it? Politics don't matter anymore. COVID-19, not as big a deal anymore. The economy, not the end of the world now. What's going to happen to me tomorrow? What's going to happen to me tomorrow is that I'm going to a new heaven and a new earth. And in the meantime, I have a God who watches over me. Oh, beloved, put a smile on your face. This is good news. You know, in Alaska, I'm told that one of the most beautiful wildflowers there is called the fireweed. And apparently this fireweed is, is, a, is really sort of a renaissance plant. It's delicate. It has purple-pink blossoms. And apparently has a number of uses. It can be brewed into a tea. And it's supposed to be good for upset stomachs, for coughs, for asthma. And if it's applied in other ways, it's supposed to be able to treat bites and cuts and even eczema. Even the blossoms can be used to make jelly or honey, I guess. Pretty versatile. Why do they call it fireweed, though? I guess they call it that because whenever there is a fire that burns through a forest, one of the first pieces of vegetation to ever come back is called the fireweed.
It's the first plant to bloom after a fire. When the smoke clears and the earth cools, these flowers emerge from the blackened earth. They cover the landscape like a stunning quilt, trading beauty for ashes. Now, beloved, the kingdom of God is sort of like this fireweed. When God finally deals with all of the stuff, all of the stuff that just needs to go, all of the byproduct of sin and the curse, that from the ashes of that, he's going to build something beautiful, something amazing, something eternal, and then he is going to join us forever. Dear ones, I pray that that encourages you. I pray that you hold on to that. I also pray that this series has been helpful to you. Uh, next week, we will start a brand new series uh, related to Thanksgiving, and then after that, one related to Christmas. And then after that, we got some really great stuff planned for you. My prayer is that you'll seek the Lord and trust Him during this time and cling to His Word and remember the things that He's promised. Father, while we worship you, Lord, I thank you for all of your goodness. I thank you for the reminder, Lord, that even though sometimes living in this place, living in this time, Father, it can be a struggle. It breaks my heart to hear how many people are committing suicide now, especially young people, Lord. Father, help us to take the message of hope out while we still can. And to remember that this is not our home, Lord. We have a glorious new home that's coming. We look forward to it. But until then, Lord, help us to do business, to prioritize the right thing, and to share the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.